Hannah Clark, a 31-year-old mother of three, a strong, independent woman who lived life to the fullest, was to have her life cut very short by the actions of one selfish individual who believed that they were dominant and superior. Hannah Clark would destroy that person's narrow-minded assumptions at a great personal cost to herself. Before we start, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Hannah Clark, who was cruelly taken from this world in the prime of her life. Camp Hill, Australia, an eastern suburb of the city of Brisbane in Queensland. The suburb was named after Teamsters, who frequently traveled between the cities of Brisbane and Cleveland, who used to camp there while in transit. In February 2020, this former farming community was home to Hannah Clark, a 31-year-old mother of three beautiful children, Aaliyah, Liana, and Trey. On the surface, Hannah was outgoing and with a bright and bubbly personality. However, like many people, if you scratched just below the surface, Hannah was dealing with problems that she would continuously try to put behind her. But tragically, these problems, not of her making, would soon catch up with her, bringing her life to a tragic and premature end. 19th of February, 2020, 8.30 a.m., Camp Hill, Brisbane. A car pulls up erratically outside of a house where a man is obliviously washing his car on a typical Wednesday morning. The next thing he hears are the loud screams of a terrified woman. He turns to see a man and a woman in the front seats of a Kia Sportage. The man, calm, with a resigned look on his face. The woman, petrified and hysterical. The stranger walks over to the car and tries to engage the couple, but before he has the chance, there is a loud bang, followed by what he described as a bright flare. The morning sky disappears behind a wall of smoke and flames along with the man's vision. When he comes to his senses, he's presented with a horrific sight. The woman is ablaze from head to toe. He quickly grabs his hose and starts spraying her. It takes some time, but he manages to extinguish the flames. He walks around to the passenger side of the car to find the man. He is sitting on the side of the road with flames flickering up and down his clothing. This was no ordinary Wednesday morning. This would be the morning that nobody involved or affected would ever forget. What had brought this man and woman to this point? Hannah Clark, born on the 8th of September 1988, was a 31-year-old mother to three beautiful children, two girls and a boy. Aaliyah, age six, Liana, age four, and Trey, just three years old. She had been described by friends and family as a bright person with a bubbly personality. People who knew her commented about how empathetic she was, coupled with a contagious and irresistible smile, with one person also saying that she was the embodiment of selflessness. She also had a competitive side. She worked as a personal trainer in a gym, was very healthy and physically fit, her children were her world, nothing came before them, and her entire life revolved around them. When she was 19 years old, she met a former rugby league player named Rowan Baxter, who had previously played for the New Zealand Warriors. He was 11 years her senior. Hannah and Rowan both took a liking to each other and began dating. This was despite her mother, Sue Clark, having some serious misgivings about Rowan. Rowan was described by people who knew him as not being too bright. He was unable to remember his four-digit bank PIN number, and when he bought a car, he didn't register it because nobody told him he had to. Being an ex-professional sportsman, he was obsessed with going to the gym and his physical appearance. He had large muscles, but he didn't acquire them entirely through hard work and training. He did, in fact, take steroids. Similar to Hannah, who did not take illegal substances, he also worked as a personal trainer at a gym. The big difference between Hannah and Baxter was that she was good at it. People liked her personality, and once she had a client on the books, they usually stayed with her. Rowan, on the other hand, did not make much money as a personal trainer. He struggled to get clients, and when he did get one, they often left him quite quickly because of his attitude towards them. A side effect to taking steroids to building muscle mass is being short-tempered. As a result, Rowan passed through a lot of gyms. After all, nobody wants a personal trainer who is making their customers uncomfortable or unhappy. 
Certainly, no gym would want a personal trainer who called their clients pigs on social media, which is what Rowan did. He specifically targeted female clients at the gym. He once commented on how he had to change the soap in the men's room three times, but not once in the women's room. Now, anyone thinking rationally and without bias would surely assume the gym just had more male clients than female, but not Rowan. Call it a mother's instinct, but Sue Clark didn't trust Baxter. She thought he was smug, cocky, and walked with the swagger that you might expect from an ex-professional athlete, not to mention the fact that he was 11 years older than her daughter, who had just barely left her teen years. This was while Baxter was 31. At the time, Baxter was still going through a divorce proceeding with his soon-to-be ex-wife, but he was still living with her, something else, as you can imagine, that did not fill Hannah's family with enthusiasm. When she introduced him to them, he assured them that he was only living with his ex because he was trying to do right by the son that he had with her. Hannah's parents seemed willing to allow the relationship to go ahead. After all, what does a parent gain by trying to tell their young son or daughter who they can or cannot date? Often, it will simply result in a parent pushing away their child, something, of course, the family did not want to happen. As Rowan assured the family, the divorce came through and the couple carried on dating. In 2011, Rowan proposed to Hannah and she said yes. The pair were married the following year in Kingscliff in New South Wales, Australia. As previously mentioned, they would go on to have three beautiful children together. Aaliyah, the eldest, was described by her grandparents as being incredibly articulate. She was reading ahead of her years and enjoyed telling stories to her younger siblings. She had also taken after her mother when it came to physical fitness. Liana, the middle child, was described as the crazy one in the family. She loved to be the center of attention and always aimed to make people laugh, bringing a lot of joy and fun into their lives. The youngest, Trey, was described as the apple of his mother's eye. He was the golden child. He was what you might call the mommy's boy. He also had a sporting side. At the age of three, he had already learned how to kick and pass a football, much to the pleasure of his sporty mom and dad. Rowan, possibly because of his personality and obvious lack of people skills, was never able to make enough money to support his family. This meant that Hannah, probably because of her likable personality, was the main breadwinner for the family. If, as we have already heard, Baxter did resent women, this would only have added to his frustrations. After all, his wife, a mere woman, was far better at his job than he was. Despite Hannah's success and Rowan's lack of it, the couple decided to open a gym together. They didn't have enough money for their venture, so Hannah's parents stepped in as financial backers. At the time, in between personal training, the couple both worked at a sports shoe retailer. Rowan had instigated this, as he seemed to like to know where Hannah was all the time. His behavior at the store was no different than at the various gyms he had worked at. He belittled the female employees, just as he had done with his clients at the gym where he worked. It seemed that Baxter could never miss an opportunity to demonstrate his superiority over women. One day, he was giving a personal training session to Hannah's mom, Sue. Given that Hannah's parents owned the gym, you would think that Rowan would be grateful and treat his mother-in-law with respect. But no. During their session, he purposely dropped her on her head, sending her violently colliding with the floor and making her bleed. Of course, anyone with an ounce of decency would have helped their mother-in-law up, apologized, and possibly gone to get the first aid kit. What did Rowan do? He stood there and laughed at her, and then proceeded to mock her lack of coordination. Amazingly, despite this incident and their own personal reservations, Hannah's parents actually tried their hardest to accept Rowan for the benefit of their daughter. They both said that in their earlier days, the relationship seemed good and both of them were happy. They noticed things starting to change after the children arrived, and they changed rapidly. Despite the fact that their business was not entirely their property due to Hannah's parents investing, Rowan's attitude towards customers did not improve, and as far as his family and in-laws were concerned, it actually got worse. When giving personal training sessions to their paying customers, he would frequently call them fat and lazy. 
On the domestic front, his behavior deteriorated as well. He started using terms such as henna misbehaved. As the result of henna's misbehavior, he would not allow her parents access to the children as a form of punishment. To be clear, he actually used the word misbehaved to her parents. The same reactions applied to Hannah's brother, who didn't like Rowan anyway. He managed to distance Hannah from her brother to such an extent that they no longer had any contact whatsoever. He even went to the extent of handpicking the clients that she could train at work and decided which of her friends she was allowed to see and when. Baxter wasn't even trying to hide his controlling behavior any longer. He was by now using every line from the domestic abuse handbook. He was cutting Hannah off from the outside world bit by bit. He was demanding sex every single day from her, and if she dared to say no, he would take it out on the children and on her. Whenever she did consent, probably through fear and coercion, he would choke her in an aggressive way. Let's be clear, couples in bedrooms have all kinds of tendencies and ways of keeping things interesting, but in all cases, this has to be between two consenting adults in an environment where they both feel safe. What Rowan was doing to Hannah was not really consenting. When he choked her, he did it with aggression, with the intent of harming her. As we hear with so many tragic domestic abuse cases, he often apologized afterwards, stating he only did it for his own gratification and hadn't realized that he was hurting her. In so many cases like this, we see women abused by aggressive control freaks, but because of the isolated situation they find themselves in, they do not realize that they are in fact victims of domestic abuse and Hannah was no different. What Rowan had resorted to now was coercion, the process where someone simply complies with their aggressor in the relationship because they know that if they do not, something bad may happen to them or even their children. We know that Hannah did not see herself as a victim because she sometimes discussed rules that Rowan had created for her. For instance, under no circumstances was she allowed to wear shorts or the color pink. He told her that pink was a bright color which attracted the attention of others. She wasn't allowed to wear shorts because the sight of her legs would attract other men. Rowan Baxter was nothing more than a jealous, narcissistic misogynist. He did the same job as his wife but was infinitely worse at it. He could never achieve the qualifications she had because he just wasn't good enough. For all of his steroid-induced muscles and shallow appearance, she was way out of his league in terms of brain power, personality, and looks, and he knew it. This was something that he couldn't stand. After all, in his world, women were vastly inferior to men. Like many men who try to control their wives or girlfriends, he felt emasculated by Hannah. To make himself feel better in some perverse way, he would berate Hannah behind closed doors. At the inquiry, one of her friends, Kylie, gave evidence and told how Rowan called his wife fat and mocked her body, telling her to lose weight and get into shape. Of course, we know nothing could have been further from the truth in relation to Hannah's physical fitness and appearance. The bullying and abuse didn't start and end with his wife. He was regularly far too rough with the children. Many parents may wrestle or play fight with their kids in a playful, fun way. However, Rowan would regularly take it too far and end up hurting them. If one of them began to cry or was hurt, he would simply laugh, far from showing any kind of sympathy. Then he would berate them. One such incident took place when he was play fighting with Aaliyah. Things went too far and she hit her head on a door frame, causing her to bleed. She was taken to the hospital for stitches and Rowan blamed the whole incident on her. As well as play fighting, he had another way of upsetting them. When he had done a workout, he regularly got an ice bath, something that a lot of sportsmen and women do to aid in muscle recovery. It is, however, unlikely that they do that to their children, especially against their will. Rowan would often force his children, even the youngest, Trey, no more than a toddler, who was often crying and screaming when he had to sit in the ice bath. Believe it or not, he used his children in ice baths as a sick marketing technique to try to drum up new clients for his personal training business, such as it was. 
posting comments on their company website such as, even my children partake in ice baths. Children, though, are not stupid. They may not have said a lot, but parents will tell you that they see and hear everything. Aaliyah, the oldest child, who we mentioned was very bright for her age, seemed to have grasped the situation that they all lived with. Out of all the three children and Hannah, Aaliyah stood up to Baxter more than anyone else. Because of what she saw, she did not like her father and often argued with him. Whenever she heard her parents having an argument, she would often try to intervene on her mother's behalf. She would slam doors in Rowan's face, tell him to get out, tell him not to ever come back again. A very brave little girl. By 2019, life for Hannah was becoming unbearable. She was being systematically suffocated by her controlling husband. Being the selfless person that she was, her first thought was for her children. She confided in people, saying that she believed Rowan was out to get her. But she was equally afraid that if she dared to go against anything he said, or, God forbid, file for divorce, that he would use the children as a weapon against her. She did tell people that he wasn't capable of harming the children, but that he may stop her from seeing them, possibly even running away with them, or try to turn them against her. A frightening thought for any mother. Perhaps Hannah was confident that Rowan would never hurt the children because he had never physically harmed her. The abuse that she was being subjected to was up to a point financial, emotional, and sexual. As previously mentioned, because she wasn't being physically attacked, she did not believe herself to be the victim of domestic abuse, a very important point to remember in this case. Later the same year, though, that would change. Rowan had been out at a jiu-jitsu class. He came home, apparently full of adrenaline, and without warning, he tripped her to the floor, leaned over her, grabbed her forcefully by the throat, and told her, you have no idea what I'm capable of. Hannah still did not think this was domestic violence, but it was worse than previous occasions. Maybe it was the implied threat that was the tipping point. Despite all of the bullying, the emotional abuse, she was still the same strong, independent woman that she had always been deep down. She was going to leave Rowan Baxter at the earliest opportunity. Hannah went and met with a police officer. She told her her entire life story and what it was like with her husband. The officer told Hannah that being made to have sex every day against her will was, in fact, a form of sexual assault. As they continued talking, the officer explained the meaning and concept of coercive behavior. And that's what Hannah was experiencing, as it was defined by law in a domestically abusive relationship. The chat with the officer lifted the blindfold from Hannah's eyes. She now seemed to realize that she was the victim of domestic abuse. As quickly as possible, she packed up the bare necessities for the children and herself and went to stay at her parents' house in Camp Hill. Perhaps what demonstrates Hannah's caring personality the most is that she didn't make a formal complaint to police. Even after the hellish ordeal that she had been put through, she felt that involving the law was kicking Rowan while he was down. Empathy that he definitely did not deserve. All she wanted was to be rid of him, get him out of her life as soon as possible through the divorce courts. In November of 2019, with the relationship finally over, although not yet divorced, Hannah decides that she would allow Rowan to see the kids. Of course, at the time, without any court orders, there was little else that she could do. But surely, in the back of her mind, there must have been thoughts that Rowan could not be 100% trustworthy with the children. Around the same time, possibly in a bid to unburden himself, Rowan started visiting his church pastor, Christopher Ensby. Christopher was, at the time, and still is, a good, caring man. He did note later that Baxter had an alpha male complex and displayed tendencies of controlling behavior. He also said that Rowan had confided in him on a few of the occasions when his guard was down. He knew that he was in the wrong and needed to change, but wasn't capable of working out how to do that. 
As a result, the pastor decided to meet the couple together at the gym. He monitored their behaviors. He watched with shock as Rowan took personal training sessions to such lengths that his clients regularly vomited. The pastor was uncomfortable watching the behavior of Rowan. These were exactly the characteristics that he was suspecting and identified during their conversations at church. He also had a private chat with Hannah. She was no longer afraid to tell the story of her ordeal. We can't be sure of her exact mindset at the time, but the pastor seems to have been trying to play the role of a de facto marriage counselor at that point. The pastor, although well-intentioned, was laboring under a misapprehension. From conversations that Hannah had with co-workers around this time, we can be fairly certain she harbored no illusions of reconciliation with Rowan. She told co-workers that she believed Rowan would one day try to kill her. Other than the one conversation she had had with a police officer, for whatever reason, Hannah had still not gone back to either make them aware that she feared for her safety or to file a formal complaint. But that was about to change. Hannah's caring nature may have put her in a vulnerable position. Baxter must have been so confident that she would not go to police that on Boxing Day, when Hannah was simply walking down the street with her children, he brazenly walked up to them, grabbed their daughter, Liana, and took her. Worried sick, Hannah didn't see her daughter for two days. She reported the incident to police who did conduct a search and found the child with her father, thankfully unharmed. Police now advised Hannah that she should make a formal complaint and get a personal protection order against Baxter. If you're listening in the UK or the US, you would call this a restraining order. This is exactly what Hannah did. Unfortunately, Baxter was still given the right to joint custody of his children, a decision that would give him the opportunity to torment Hannah further, not just mentally, but physically. A day after taking his children out, he returned them to Hannah's parents' home as required. But out of spite, he had placed pictures of Hannah in her underwear around the outside of his car for the children to see. When Hannah came out to get the children, she attempted to take the photos down. Baxter aggressively grabbed her by the lower arm, spraining her wrist, and subsequently busting her lip. Now this was physical assault, and it may have continued if Hannah's mom, Sue, had not seen the incident and come running out of the house to her daughter's aid. Baxter let go and then shouted, hold, and drove off. This incident was reported to police. The physical assault clearly breached the protection order, but authorities were unable to act quickly enough to prevent the events that were about to follow. The 19th of February, 2020, at 8.30 in the morning, Hannah leaves her parents' home as normal to take her three children to school. As they all get into her Kia Sportage, they are joined by an unwelcome guest. Rowan Baxter forced his way into the passenger seat. Hannah, terrified for her children and herself, tries to plead with him, but it's no use. Baxter was enraged and wouldn't listen. He kept screaming in her ear to drive. Eventually, she complied. As she turned onto Raven Street, Hannah, still somehow managing to think rationally, sees a man further down the road washing his car. Whatever was going to happen, she wanted to have a witness. Between spotting the man and pulling up outside of his house, events escalated. Baxter had been carrying a can full of gasoline, which he remorselessly poured all over Hannah and the children. The man washing his car was Michael Zemek. He said that the quiet, uneventful Wednesday morning was interrupted by the sound of a car pulling up outside of his home rather urgently. No one would be prepared for what would happen next, and Michael says he will never forget it. A woman shouted out from the car, Call the police! He's trying to kill me! He poured petrol on me! Mr. Zemek said that Baxter had Hannah gripped in a tight bear hug. She was screaming frantically and trying to escape the vehicle. Mr. Zemek approached the passenger side window of the car. Rowan Baxter looked him straight in the eyes with a blank, almost unconcerned stare. The last thing Mr. Zemek saw was Baxter holding a lighter, which he lit without hesitation. By the time Mr. Zemek, 
who had been taken aback by the blast, managed to look up. He saw the whole front of the car on fire. Amazingly, Hannah, fully engulfed in flames from head to toe, managed to get herself out of the car. She was screaming loudly, not for herself, but for her children. By pure coincidence, an off-duty paramedic was driving past and jumped out to help. She heard Hannah scream, my babies are in the car, why didn't I just stay in there with them? Mr. Zemek, thinking quickly, grabbed his hose and began trying to extinguish the flames that were ravaging her body. We should note at this point that Mr. Zemek had been standing at the passenger's side window. He too had suffered burns to his hands and face, but acted courageously to try to help Hannah before thinking of himself. The paramedic and Michael, while using his hose, encouraged Hannah to drop and roll in an effort to extinguish the flames faster, but she kept saying, I didn't save my kids, I couldn't save my kids. Mr. Zemek didn't see any children in the car from his brief glance, so he wasn't aware of their presence beforehand. As soon as he realized, he did try to get to the car to see if there was any chance that the children were still alive and could be saved, but the intense heat and the ferocity of the fire made that impossible. By this point, Hannah was laying on the garden, severely burned, muttering the words, My kids, somebody get to my kids. No one knew it at this point, but Hannah had suffered burns over 97% of her body. Literally, the only part of her body that wasn't burned was the bottom of her feet. It's hard to find the words how to describe how unbearably painful that must have been. Yet, her first thoughts were still for the lives of her three young children. The person who described her as the embodiment of selflessness could not have been more correct. Despite her horrific injuries, police did try to reassure her, but they knew that she had virtually no chance of surviving. It seems that Hannah herself knew she wasn't going to live, but in an amazing show of strength and courage, she battled through the pain to give the police three separate statements. Senior Constable Angus Skeynes approached Hannah clearly dying. She was still making a desperate effort to make sure that everyone knew who had done this. Hannah said, my ex-husband, he got, he got in the, the constable asked his name. Hannah replied and said that there was a protection order against him. Hannah told Constable Skeynes that she had spotted a man washing his car and told him to call the police. Hannah continued to tell them how Baxter had poured petrol all over the inside of the car and set it on fire. The full transcript from the officer's body cam shows how hard Hannah fought and hung on to get those details out. She spelled her first, middle, and last names and gave a description of Baxter, even his clothes. Hannah was growing weaker. Constable Skeynes stayed with her, telling her that she was doing an amazing job. Mr. Skeynes was commended after the incident. He was told that had Baxter survived, his professionalism in dealing with a severely wounded person like Hannah Clark would have been invaluable to convicting him. Even as life was ebbing away from Hannah, tragically, she still didn't seem to realize to what extent she had been abused all those years. The officer asked her, has he done anything threatening before? Hannah replied, not to me. No. Paramedics took over at that point to try to provide her with some pain relief. You might be wondering what happened to Rowan Baxter while all of this was going on. Was he trying to save his children? Did he even ask about his children? No. He had suffered burns over 80% of his body. He managed to get out of the car. He went to sit on the roadside and Mr. Zemek also extinguished the flames on his clothing. Various Good Samaritans joined in the effort to put the fire out in the car. When the flames in the front of the car had been extinguished, he went and sat in the passenger seat again. He was rooting around, obviously looking for something. One member of the public was trying to get close to the car to extinguish the rest of the flames, but Baxter stopped her. He found what he had been looking for, a knife that he had brought with him. Every time the person came close with a fire extinguisher, Baxter drew the knife. 
She said that she felt like he was guarding the car, preventing the fire from being fully extinguished. By this point, there was little to no chance for those poor children being alive or even surviving, but people wanted to try all the same. It was Baxter himself who prevented any form of rescue attempt for his own children. He made 100% certain that no one could try to get them out. Another neighbor told Baxter to drop the knife, telling him it wasn't worth it, clearly fearing for the safety of others in the vicinity. Baxter didn't drop the knife. Instead, he took the coward's way out. As his children's bodies were burning behind him and his wife was dying in front of him, the selfish bully plunged the knife into his chest, into his own heart, and died on the spot. In cases where the defendant is no longer alive to defend themselves, an inquest is still held in hopes that important lessons can be learned and changes can be made to prevent such horrors in the future. People who had known Baxter and Hannah and the pair of them when they were a couple all testified to what a controlling bully Rowan Baxter really was. Nicole, Hannah's friend who went to police on her behalf, also spoke. She told of her disappointment that the police had failed to act when she tried to warn them that something may happen to Hannah and the children. Hannah's mom also testified about the treatment her daughter had suffered and told the inquest how Baxter had dropped her on her head at the gym. The pastor that Baxter had turned to testified as well, speaking of how he tried to talk with him and help him change. But he also said that he believed Baxter had no remorse for his controlling behavior. A note was found that had been written on the 26th of January 2020 by Baxter before he killed Hannah and the children. Clearly written by someone who saw themselves as a victim, he wrote that he wasn't going to take her abuse any longer. She was going to realize what it was like to be unable to see her children. He accused Hannah of destroying his life. He signed the note from himself and, oddly, the children. Could it be that he was originally planning to abduct the children and run away with them as a way of punishing Hannah? We'll never know. As was heard in the inquest, February 13, 2020, less than a week before Hannah and her children were killed, she had confided in friends about her fears of her life being in danger. Hannah's friend, Nicole Brooks, took the initiative and went to police on her behalf. She told the police that she was convinced that Hannah and her children were in mortal danger and that Rowan would try, in her words, to take them out. Police reacted sympathetically to Nicole's concerns, but made it clear that until Rowan Baxter either made a physical threat or actually did something, they were powerless to act. Nicole continued to plead with the police to take her more seriously. She told them about the incident after Baxter's jiu-jitsu class and even said to the police, what if you don't get a second chance to act? Police gave the same answer. They couldn't act until Baxter did something. Law enforcement and the courts were there to uphold the law, not to act as vigilantes, no matter the situation. Had tighter laws been in place for the protection of women who find themselves in abusive relationships, perhaps the authorities could have done something more quickly. Perhaps Hannah, Aaliyah, Liana, and Trey would still be alive today. The senior paramedic on the site spoke of Hannah's bravery. He said that when he saw her, he knew that she was injured to such an extent that she would not survive. Despite this, he believes, even now, that her pain and her survival was of no concern to her. She was only thinking of her children and making sure that police knew exactly who had committed this crime. Hannah Clark died in the hospital later that day. She was just 31 years old. Her children, Aaliyah, Liana, and Trey, just six, four, and three years old, respectively, all victims of domestic abuse, all of them with years of living ahead of them. All Hannah wanted to do was get her family away from this dangerous individual, and despite her best efforts, she was unable to do so. 
Courage can be spoken about in many contexts. Courage on a battlefield, courage in dealing with the loss of a loved one, the courage of facing a new challenge. For Hannah, courage was lying on a garden, her body 97% burned, knowing that she was facing her last moments on this earth, and worse still, knowing that her children had been taken away from her, she still managed to stand up to the coward who made her life miserable for all of those years. Her final act of defiance was to make sure that she finally told her story, proving that no amount of pain or heartache would make her inferior to anyone else. Hannah, along with her children, were buried together on the 9th of March, 2020. Since the tragic murders of Hannah and her children, the Clark family, led by Hannah's mother, set up the Small Steps for Hannah Foundation. Their mission is to put a halt to the incidence and severity of domestic and family violence in Australia. Four days after the murder, a public vigil was held in which over 1,000 people attended. A small corner of Australia will forever be dedicated to her in Camp Hill, named Hannah's Place. There is a dedication to her along with a shelter and newly planted trees in her memory. In December 2020, Hannah Clark was named one of Marie Claire's Women of the Year. The award was for her courage and bravery in raising awareness of domestic abuse in Australia. We at Beyond Evil would like to pay our own tribute to the life of Hannah Clark and her young children. Murders happen in all kinds of unimaginable ways. Hannah Clark was such a strong woman that she did not see herself as the victim of domestic abuse, but undeniably she was. She spent her personal life being the best mother, daughter, and sister that she could. She carried this practice through into her professional life, becoming a talented personal trainer. Someone who people wanted to be around, strong, independent, competitive, and much loved. In almost her final act in this life, she proved what everyone had already known. She wasn't inferior, and no woman is inferior to any man. If you suspect that you may be a victim of domestic abuse, remember this case. Remember Hannah Clark, her bravery. Seek help. Do not suffer in silence. We dedicate this documentary to the courage and defiance of Hannah Clark. May she rest in peace. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video. Comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Did you know that less than half of the people who view our videos are subscribed? It's easy and free. Also, hit that notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.